My name is Owen Jackson and I'm the Deputy CEO of the Climate Institute. Over the next two weeks I'll be in Durban, South Africa, reporting back and monitoring on the progress that's being made at the climate negotiations and putting them into an Australian context. I thought I'd start off, however, with just identifying um, a couple of key misconceptions around the negotiations that have emerged in the public debate. The first is that if Durban doesn't deliver a treaty, then it will have failed. This is a really all or nothing approach to international negotiations or how you might judge international negotiations and, and tends to overlook some of the key practical progress that these negotiations make, even in the absence of agreeing a treaty. And I'll just give one classic example, which is Copenhagen. It was perceived by many and most as a failure. Uh, however, that generally overlooks some of the key progress that was made at the meeting. We knew in Copenhagen, in advance of Copenhagen, that it wasn't going to deliver a treaty despite all the media expectation around that. But what it did deliver for the first time is a process by where we've now got 80% of emissions globally um, covered by international commitments to take action on climate change. So in the past we had around 25% of global emissions covered under the Kyoto Protocol in terms of commitments to act. Now we've got countries from India, China, the United States, Australia, Japan, the United European Union, all committing internationally to take action on climate change. And that had never happened before. We'd always had this world where only advanced economies acted. Now we're, having a, we're getting commitments from a broad range of economies and indeed all major emitters. And that's despite the fact that we don't agree an international treaty in Copenhagen. Since Copenhagen, those commitments that were made have now been moved under the UN framework in what are called the Cancun Agreements. And those moving those commitments under the UN process, as well as making some practical progress on some of the other issues which I'll discuss in these blogs, like international financing, transparency, um, adaptation and technology transfer, have allowed for practical progress to be made at an international level in building a stronger and more effective global framework. The other misconception that emerges from the debate is one that, if, unless you have a treaty, countries don't act. Now, to the extent that was true 15 years ago, where we had very few countries acting on climate change, mainly European countries who were at the time implementing carbon taxes and regulations around energy. Since then, the world is very different. We've gone from a situation where we have China dominating the global clean energy industry, closely followed by other countries, by well, some countries in Europe, but also the United States. We have a world where um, Australia has put in place, of course, its domestic emissions trading scheme. We've got South Korea who are committing to put in place an emissions trading scheme and spending lots of government money, um, particularly in their economic stimulus package, on driving low pollution technology development. Now, that's not being driven by the fact that by an international treaty. We actually don't have an international treaty post-2012 which covers all of those countries. But what we do have is economic self-interest. So China is acting not because just because it's committed internationally to reduce pollution, but it's also acting because it wants to limit air pollution. It wants to reduce its reliance on the import of foreign energy sources like oil. It wants to position itself as the dominant player in the global and the emerging clean energy economy. Europe's acting for a whole range of reasons. A, it sees itself as a leader on climate change, but also it sees, again, that it wants to be part and a key player in the global clean energy economy. Um, so you're getting a much, much more diverse range of drivers that are emerging at an international level, not just a treaty. So the reality is that even in the absence of treaty, the world is acting. And just to give you one more statistic on this, over the last few years, the total amount of investment in clean energy like wind and solar is now starting to compete with investment in fossil fuels like oil, coal and gas. And that doesn't happen by accident. That's happening because we have countries acting to reduce pollution, build energy security and clean up their economies. So as we head into Durban, we shouldn't think, A, that it's going to deliver a treaty. It's not. But what it can deliver is some concrete and practical outcomes that can enhance and further shape global cooperation on climate change. The second point is, once we go into Durban, we can't think just because we don't have an international treaty post-2012 that countries aren't acting. They are, but they're acting for a diverse range of reasons because they know that it's in their long-term economic self-interest to do so. And I think the last point to make, and for the first time in the history of the negotiations, Australia will be able to stand up amongst those countries who are already acting and say, we have a credible policy that can meet the commitments that we've made internationally. And that'll be the first, in the 20 years of the negotiations, we'll be in a situation where we can credibly do that. So 
Despite what you read in the media, Australia is at no risk of going it alone. We can act in Durban and build stronger cooperation and put in place the framework and the development of the building blocks for a regime that will actually start to deliver on avoiding dangerous climate change.